Good evening and welcome to the ASV and ASSA Vic South Star Party. Uh, the Star Party is usually held at the Little Desert Nature Lodge. However, uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we're running it as a live stream event this year uh, over the weekend, so tonight and tomorrow and tomorrow night. I'd like to uh, now introduce you to Joe Greeter, who will give you some history uh, about the Vic South Star Party and how it came to be uh, before he takes us on a tour of the night sky. Um, following this, we'll be bringing you uh, uh, the night sky to your home through the ASV and ASSA member telescopes. Uh, also, please note that both raffles will be drawn tomorrow night, so you still have time to grab a ticket to win one of those wonderful prizes and the links to the tickets are on both the ASSA and the ASV Facebook pages. Uh, so let's bring Joe in. Good evening, Joe. How are you going? Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to tonight. So am I, actually. It should be a fun one. So did you want to tell us a little bit about how the um, ASV, ASSA, uh, Vic South Star Party came to be? Sure. Well, it came about... Uh, over dinner in 2002 with a glass of red wine, good South Australian red wine. Uh, we were uh, having the National Australian Convention of Am Amateur Astronomers in Adelaide in 2002 and uh, Perry Vlahos from the ASB and I got talking about uh, how we could uh, have more uh, interaction between the uh, between the two societies and uh, one of the things that we came up with was a joint uh, star party and the other was the uh, annual um, ASA ASV speaker exchange that we that we have as well um, so the first trial run uh, for the uh, Vic South uh, star party uh, began in 2003 and we decided to pick somewhere exactly halfway between uh, uh, Melbourne and uh, Adelaide. And uh, when I put my finger on the map, uh, it pointed to uh, Little Desert uh, National Park. Um, and uh, at the edge of the park is uh, Little Desert Nature Lodge, uh, which turned out to be the absolutely ideal venue for us to, uh, to host the star party there. Uh, we take over the entire uh, venue. Uh, it can house around about uh, 70 to 80 people. Uh, we have a big oval where we can set up our, uh, our telescopes and we can keep the visual observers on one, one end of the oval and the uh, astrophotographers with all their computers and cameras and everything else at the other end of the oval facing away from us. Yeah, we don't like and we have No, that's right. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, talks uh, and quizzes and uh, uh, socialising all, uh, all weekend. It's usually held from Friday uh, through to Monday. Um, on the Friday night, uh, it's uh, tradition now that we always invite the local uh, uh, public uh, to come and join us on the Oval uh, to, for the first couple of hours as soon as it gets dark to have a look at the night sky. And then we carry on with uh, whatever we want to uh, observe under what are really very nice dark uh, dark skies. The, the beautiful skies. I've been twice in the last four years. So enjoyed both times immensely. Well, I haven't I haven't missed one yet. I uh, wish I could. This one would have been, uh, this one would have been the eighteenth, I think. I, this I was year. just about to say how many years. So eighteen. So eighteen years. This would have been this year. Well, yeah. you, have, you still haven't missed one because we're doing it right now. And, and oh, absolutely. There we go. We managed to whip this up in, in about four weeks. So um, not an easy thing to do, but, yeah, we've got it going. We've got uh, two astronomical societies who are separated by closed borders at the moment, and we're managing to, uh, with the wonders of technology, do a live stream. Now, you've got a... Um, a lovely presentation for us tonight uh, for the sky for the night. Um, did you want to get that going now? Sure can. I'll just share my screen, Mark. Yep. There we go. All right. You can see that clearly. 
We can. Now, would you like me to make that full screen? Uh, or would you like to, uh, to Yep, yeah. let's make that full screen. Yeah, so everyone screen. will still be able to, there you go. Everyone will still be able to hear you talking. So I'll let you run yeah. with it. And um, if anyone has any questions, pop them in the chat and um, we'll pop them up on the screen for Joe to answer. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for watching. Um, I'm not going to bring you the sky for the night. I'm going to leave that to Perry uh, to do tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, but what I'm going to do is cover the sky for November for the whole month. So I'm, I'm going to show you some sites that you should be able to get out and have a look for yourself uh, with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope or even just the, the naked eye if that is all that, um, that you've got. So let's draw the curtains and uh, get going. Okay, so uh, here we have the uh, sky above our heads uh, as, at, uh, as at now. The middle of the chart is directly over our head uh, and obviously the edges of the circle are the uh, horizon. Um, we will start over in the west because as the stars are rotating from uh, west to east, uh, they are, as the Earth is rotating from west to east, the stars rise in the east and set in the west. So whatever is in the west is going to set on us uh, reasonably quickly. Um, so we'll uh, investigate that part of the sky first. So let's just zoom in on the, the western part of the sky. And uh, if you do have a clear sky tonight, uh, unlike me here in the uh, Adelaide Hills where it's completely overcast, um, but if I could go out there and uh, look up in the uh, in the west, I'd be able to see the two planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, quite close to uh, quite close together, uh, within the bounds of the uh, constellation of uh, Sagittarius, the uh, the Archer. We'll talk more about Jupiter and Saturn a little bit further uh, down in the uh, in the presentation. So let's just do a walk around the sky uh, at the moment. Um, you can see here um, the uh, asterism that we know as the teapot uh, right here. Here's the lid of the teapot. There's the body. There's a spout and there's a handle there. And usually when I'm showing people this out in the open sky and you can see the Milky Way, I tell them that the Milky Way is a steam coming out of the, uh, coming out of the teapot. Let's move around towards the uh, the southwest, and we can just see the tail of Scorpius the Scorpion here uh, starting to uh, starting to set. Um, one of the things that always reminds me that uh, summer is definitely coming is uh, when we've got Scorpius uh, setting in the uh, west southwest, and then as we go over to the eastern side. We got the constellation of Orion, the Mighty Hunter, uh, coming up in the uh, uh, in the east. Let's just come back here towards the the southwest. So we've got Scorpius there, uh, slightly uh, already setting. As we move further towards the uh, the south, uh, the two pointers uh, in the sky, Alpha and Beta Centauri. Um, Unless you've got a clear horizon, um, very soon you may not be able to see these as they get lost in behind buildings and hills or trees because they do get quite uh, quite low in the sky. And uh, to the left of the pointers, uh, we've got the, the Southern Cross, the very famous Southern Cross, one of the smallest constellations in the sky, uh, but per square degree, it's got the greatest number of bright stars in it. Um, Completely um, unmistakable. It's really easy to see the uh, the Southern Cross. And these two guys here, Alpha and Beta Centauri, are colder pointers uh, because as uh, the sky rotates um, around the South Celestial Pole here, all of these stars rotate around here like this. So the pointers appear to always chase the uh, the Southern Cross. So they they're called the the pointers now. These two stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, if you do go outside and get to see them, uh, you would notice that uh, one is, is slightly dimmer than the other. You can see the, 
The circle here for Beta Centauri is slightly smaller than the one for Alpha, which means that Alpha is, is a brighter, brighter star. By the way, uh, all the constellations, uh, the stars within a constellation, are named in order of brightness using the Greek uh, alphabet. So Alpha, being the very first letter of the alphabet, means that uh, Alpha Centauri is the brightest star in Centaurus, and Beta is the second brightest star in uh, Centaurus. Now these two, when you when you look at them visually outside and out in the dark, um, they do look slightly dimmer, but not by much. Alpha is the closest star to us other than our own sun. Uh, so if I was to point a laser pointer at Alpha Centauri and there was nothing to stop that laser uh, on its travels to Alpha Centauri, it would take just over four years traveling at the speed of light, which is 150,000 kilometers. No, sorry, 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, beta being slightly fainter, you would think that it is only slightly further away. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth because Beta Centauri is almost 900 light years away. Um, so it's 200 over 200 times further away. So really that tells us that Beta Centauri in real life is the much brighter, much hotter star. And in actual fact, that's exactly what it is. A Beta Centauri is a, a bluish white star with a surface temperature of around about 35,000 degrees, whereas Alpha Centauri is actually almost a twin of our own uh, of our own sun. So it's got a surface temperature of about four to five thousand uh, five thousand degrees. The other interesting thing that you will find of the pointers of Alpha Centauri, uh, if you do point a telescope to it, is that all of a sudden it becomes two stars. Um, Alpha Centauri is actually made up of two stars that rotate around each other once every 80 years or so. Uh, and the two stars are separated by about the same distance that separates uh, uh, the Sun and the planet, uh, planet Neptune. Uh, gorgeous view uh, in a telescope. It looks like two big car headlights coming, uh, coming towards you on a, on a dark night. Uh, recommend that you, when you get the chance to look through a telescope, have a look at Alpha, Alpha Centauri, closest star to us uh, other than our own uh, sun. As we move around the uh, uh, east of the southern sky towards the, uh, towards the east, another star that always reminds me that summer is coming is Canopus, the second brightest star in the, uh, in the sky. It's around about 130 uh, light years away. Uh, again, another a big white bluish star. Um, unmissable. Uh, very easy to find in the uh, in the sky. This part of the the sky um, in the southeast is the void of real bright stars. So Canopus really really stands out. Uh, these two little patches that we see here, the large and small Magellanic clouds, we'll talk about those a little bit later on in the presentation, as well as this object here labelled 104. We'll talk about those uh, a, little, uh, a little later. Um, as we head towards the east, we come across Sirius. Uh, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. I usually trick people when I ask them, can you tell me what the brightest star in the sky is? Um, and they never mention the sun. They always say it's Sirius. Of course, the brightest star in our sky is the sun, but in our evening sky, it is, or morning sky, depending on the season, uh, it is Sirius. Uh, Sirius uh, is around about nine light years away. So my laser pointer would be uh, traveling at 300,000 kilometers an hour, uh, 300,000 kilometers a second uh, would take nine years to get to uh, to Sirius. And if there was another Joe on a planet around Sirius and he decided to reflect that laser beam back at me, um, I wouldn't see that beam coming back for 18 years. Nine years there and nine years back. As we head around towards further to the east, the constellation of Orion, the mighty hunter of uh, Greek uh, Greek mythology. Uh, 
very easy constellation to uh, to pick if you've had a, a number of uh, red wines. Um, one of the problems uh, with uh, picking, especially the constellations that are supposed to represent a human, um, is that um, the constellations were created by the uh, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Arabs mostly, and of course they were all from the northern hemisphere. So we see Orion. In, in the southern hemisphere standing on his head. So you can see here, uh, this little group of stars here makes up the, the head of Orion. Um, there are the tips of his two shoulders, uh, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix. Uh, there's the belt uh, around the waist of uh, Orion the hunter. And here are his, his two, uh, two kneecaps, Rigel over here and Saif over, over here. And it is, it, He's holding a shield up, and what hasn't risen yet uh, in the eastern sky is his uh, left arm where he's holding a club uh, because he's actually at the moment fighting Taurus the bull, which is sitting over here. And this little V shape there, that's the, the face of the bull. And Aldebaran, uh, nice, big, uh, bright orange star is one of his eyes, and here are his horns, one there and one over here. Uh, as we head a little bit further towards the northeast, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Seven Sisters. Uh, we, uh, we refer to them uh, as astronomers as the Pleiades. Um, so just quickly, Joe, we've got a question for you from uh, Jamie Lee wants to know, is Betelgeuse bigger than our sun? Uh, yes, Betelgeuse is a much, much larger star. Betelgeuse, uh, if we replaced our sun with Betelgeuse, you would find that most of the inner planets, that is uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, almost going out to Jupiter. Um, it is a really, really large star. Beautiful. And uh, much, as we answer. go along here, as I said, there's the Pleiades, a beautiful view in a uh, in a telescope. Uh, seven uh, bright stars that make up that little group. When you look at them with binoculars or a telescope, um, you'll be able to see many, many more, uh, uh, many more stars. And uh, the seven sisters are also the uh, same uh, symbol uh, that Subaru cars uh, use for. Uh, uh, for the for the brand and actually Subaru um, translates to seven sisters. Uh, as we head towards the uh, the north, obviously, uh, if you if you're looking uh, looking north and high up in the sky, you see a very bright uh, reddish orange star. Um, that's not always there because that's the planet Mars. Uh, we've uh, just encountered it. Uh, on our path around the solar system uh, very close. Um, we came within 57 million kilometres of it uh, last month. And uh, as we move uh, around our orbit, we're actually leaving it behind now, but we'll talk about that in a little, uh, in a little while and explain exactly what uh, the mechanism that's going on there. But certainly get out there. Uh, if, you, if you have a friend or you know somebody with a telescope, get out there. And have a look at uh, have a good look at Mars. Uh, always a nice uh, a nice view. Uh, the other very prominent constellation in the northern sky is Pegasus, the winged horse of uh, Greek uh, uh, mythology. And the great square of Pegasus here is relatively easy to see, especially if you uh, shade your eyes from street lights and, and that. Uh, that should be too hard to uh, uh, to see. And at the bottom of uh, uh, here are the hind legs of uh, uh, of Pegasus, and we'll, sh we'll talk about this area uh, in much more detail later on. But we come to a uh, a galaxy uh, called M31 by its catalogue number, or uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, as we all uh, as we all know it. And uh, we'll talk about that one in a in a little while. And uh, I think that has been our walk. Uh, around the sky. Uh, many of the constellations that we have uh, high over our head are 
quite faint. Um, so uh, if you live in uh, uh, the uh, suburbs of Melbourne or the suburbs of, uh, of Adelaide, uh, there aren't many of uh, these stars here that you can see, except for uh, Akana, which is uh, which is quite bright, and that's the uh, the end of the constellation of Eridanus, uh, the river, which stretches all the way from near Rigel in Orion. Uh, this is one of the longer constellations uh, um, in the sky. All right, uh, let's move on. One of the things I always like to talk about, because it spends half of its uh, uh, time in our, uh, in our sky each month, is, is the moon. And uh, some of us who are what we call deep sky observers don't like to spend uh, too much time when, uh, outside when the moon's there because it uh, uh, pushes out so much stray light into the night sky that uh, it does blot out many of the fainter things or the faint fuzzies, as we like to call them, that we like to, uh, we like to look at. But the moon itself is really a fascinating uh, object to study. Um, you can do it with a very small telescope. You can see the craters and mountains on the moon uh, really, really well. So if you were interested in uh, looking at the moon, the best time to do that um, is um, later on in the month. Uh, at the moment, the moon has been very bright. It was uh, new at the beginning of the uh, beginning of the week. Uh, sorry, it was full at the beginning of the week, so it's been very bright in our sky. Uh, during this uh, during this week, by the weekend it will start rising about midnight, uh, which means that it frees up the evening sky for you to start uh, start looking at uh, uh, darker, uh, fainter things in the in the sky. So this area here uh, is great for uh, uh, dark sky uh, viewing right up until about the twentieth of uh, November, when the uh, crescent after the new moon starts to appear in our evening sky again. So I always say dark sky this month, 8th to the 20th of November, and then if you're looking at the moon or double stars, uh, 1st to the 7th or the 21st to the 30th of, uh, of November. And whilst we're talking about the moon, I always introduce a, uh, a feature on, on the moon that I like to talk about, and uh, this month, um, it's one of the lunar seas. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Mare Nectaris, or the Sea of Nectar. Um, the red arrow here points to Mare Nectaris. Uh, the thin crescent moon, uh, soon after new moon, starts to get bigger uh, on this side. So usually um, around about day five or day six after new moon is the best time to look at uh, to look at uh, at this area as i said around five to six days after new moon in our case this month it's around about november the 20th now mara nectaris is an impact basin which was formed a long time ago very soon after the uh, moon had uh, had formed around right about 3.9 to 3.8 billion years ago. Give you an idea, this size here is 350 kilometers in, in diameter. Um, when the impact originally occurred, it was actually a bit larger. Uh, the impact crater came out to around here, and we'll talk about this area in a, in a second. Uh, but the the bottom or the lowest part of the basin was uh, covered in, in lava and smooth, um, and the uh, the rest of it has uh, remained quite uh, quite pitted with later uh, bombardment by uh, by meteors. Uh, this escarpment here, as I said, is the basically the far edge of that impact, uh, and it's known as the Altai Scarp or the Rupus Altai. And this cliff face around here is around about a thousand meters high, so it's quite a it'd be quite a spectacular sight for uh, astronauts that go to uh, to visit it. A, a few craters here, Fracastorius over here. Uh, this was a crater that had formed uh, after the impact, uh, but before the 
lava started to fill the bottom of the impact basin, and that uh, that lava flow actually melted uh, the northern part of the uh, the crater and formed this uh, horseshoe. This is 124 kilometres in diameter. Very very easy for you to be able to see through a uh, through a small telescope. Even with a small telescope, you should be able to get uh, to view uh, detail to within two or three kilometres in diameter. Um, so the moon is a fascinating uh, object to uh, to look at when you can't look at the faint fuzzies. There's a, a trio of uh, craters at the edge of the basin uh, here, Theophilus, Cyrillus and Katharina. Uh, these, when the sun is just starting to, uh, to rise over this area of the, the moon, can look really spectacular, um, especially when, as the sun's rays are coming from this end, uh, they're illuminating this part of the crater rim and the little peak in the middle. So you see this little peak shining in the blackness. You see the crescent of uh, the rim and nothing else. All this is uh, still in darkness on uh, on this side. Looks quite uh, quite specky. Certainly have a uh, have a look at it. It's quite a deep crater. It's uh, uh, Theophilus is uh, nearly four thousand four hundred meters deep. Uh, so imagine the uh, uh, force of the impact that uh, caused uh, caused that. And uh, lastly, uh, I thought I'd highlight Piccolomini uh, crater Piccolomini over here. Again, it's got a little uh, uh, little peak in the in the middle, and it's eighty eight kilometers in uh, in diameter. And you're probably wondering why uh, some of these craters have got these peaks in them in the in the middle. Well, next time you're down in the park and uh, uh, there's a lake nearby, or you come against a pool of water, just drop a uh, pebble in the pond. And uh, when the the pebble hits the water, uh, you get that little peak uh, rising. And that's is exactly what happened here during the impact. The whole area uh, is uh, is molten. And uh, the centre rises up, and it starts to solidify before it uh, um, has a chance to go back down completely. Right, the planets. Where are they? Well, we've already spoken about uh, about Mars. Mars is in the in the evening sky, uh, shining very brightly, very easy to see. Uh, Venus and Mercury uh, are seen in the morning sky. Um, at the uh, at the moment, you can see them here in, in their orbit, and we'll talk about Earth and Mars in uh, just a second. Uh, and this is uh, these diagrams are for the middle of the uh, middle of the month, and uh, the outer solar system uh, with uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, uh, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and uh, and Pluto over here. You can see here uh, that uh, if we're looking out from the inner part of the solar system. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto are all in a line. So that's why we see them in the same part of the sky. Uh, just remember that they are separated by huge distances. That line of sight thing is just that. It's line of sight. It's not that they're all uh, together, close together. Jupiter and Saturn are probably the easiest of the planets to observe uh, with a telescope. Um, even a, a good pair of uh, a steadily held binoculars uh, will show you a Jupiter uh, in much better fashion uh, than the telescope that Galileo first made uh, when he started uh, appearing at the heavens back in uh, 16, uh, 1609. And uh, he saw uh, the planet and its uh, four moons um, and deduced that uh, the, those four little stars that he could see were orbiting around uh, around the planet. Um, Jupiter is huge. Um, if you could fill Jupiter with Earths, it would take nearly thirteen hundred Earths to make uh, to make one Jupiter. Uh, the solar system is basically made up of our Sun, uh, Jupiter, and then the rest of the planets which make up the rubble. Um, it, it is a huge, uh, huge planet. It's got four major moons. They're called the Galilean moons, uh, named after Galileo who first uh, saw them. Uh, they are Io, uh, which we can see in this image uh, uh, here, this diagram, 
Uh, there's Europa over here, and then uh, Ganymede and Callisto as well. Now, those four moons, um, you can actually see them uh, change their position in relation to Jupiter uh, within half an hour or so. So that's something that you can do very easily in uh, in one evening. Um, and of course, on the right, we've got uh, the uh, planet Saturn. I call it the glamour puss of the solar system. Uh, I don't think I've ever come across anybody who has looked at, at Saturn and not come away completely gobsmacked. Just on that, what? just on that, Joe, the first planet, in fact, the first object I ever saw through a telescope was Saturn. And and I tell people it's almost like someone stuck a photo on the end of the telescope. Uh, it was just so amazing to see the detail. Um, uh, yeah. It's stuck with me, and then I think it always will. Just the beauty of it through a telescope, it's hard to believe it's real. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Mark. Um, Saturn was also the very first uh, planet I ever saw through through a telescope when I was uh, still in uh, uh, early high school, and our science teacher took me to the Astronomical Society's observatory one evening. I took the whole class there. And we saw Saturn. I went home and said to my parents, "I want a telescope for Christmas." And that was uh, that was really uh, what fired up my um, interest in uh, astronomy. I already had an interest, um, but uh, looking at Saturn through a telescope absolutely blew me away. And uh, that, that that was the beginning uh, fifty years ago now, over fifty years ago. And uh, my interest in astronomy has never been uh, never been greater than what it is at the moment. All right, so if we turn our uh, eye to the west um, towards the uh, 19th, on the 19th of November, around about 9 p.m. or 9.30 p.m. for Victorians uh, watching, um, you'll be able to see the uh, uh, moon, the crescent moon, uh, Jupiter and Saturn very close uh, together um, in the uh, in the western sky. And if we uh, give you a binocular view um, of it, uh, this is what you would uh, you would see: um, Jupiter, the crescent moon, and Saturn all in uh, all in one view. That that would look quite uh, quite spectacular. So uh, put that in your diary, nineteenth of November. We mentioned uh, Mars. Uh, Mars is in the uh, northern, uh, high in the northern sky um, at the uh, at the moment, uh, within the constellation of uh, Pisces, the uh, the fish. Uh, over here, uh, we have Cetus, the uh, the whale. Um, Aries, the ram, and over here, uh, uh, Pegasus, the uh, the winged horse. And we'll talk about him in a, in a short while. But let's just concentrate on bright Mars um, up here. All you've got to do is walk out the door and, and look high in the north and you can't miss it. It draws, it draws you to it straight away. So what's happening with Mars? Uh, Mars's orbit around the sun is not as circular as the Earth's is. Um, so because it's more, elli more elliptical than, uh, than Earth's, there are times uh, when the position of the two planets is such that they come quite close to each other. Uh, like 6th of October 2020, uh, when they were within 62 million kilometres of each other. Um, as Earth is closer to the Sun than Mars is, it moves faster in its orbit. Um, Mars takes twice as long to orbit the Sun as the Earth does. So as the Earth moves around, it leaves Mars behind, as it's doing right now, um, so that you can see the gap here between the planets is getting uh, bigger. Um, so as Earth moves uh, moves around, it leaves Mars behind, and the size of Mars in your telescope scope shrinks very, very rapidly. And uh, over here, uh, we have uh, some of the other dates uh, over the next 15 years or so, uh, where Mars uh, is at opposition, so that both the Earth and Mars uh, lie in the same line with the Sun. So you've got the Sun, you've got the Earth, 
and you've got Mars. So in 2025, the distance between Earth and Mars is 96 million uh, kilometres, whereas last month it was only 62 uh, million kilometres. So Mars will be much smaller. And it gets even worse in 2027. It's 114 million kilometres away. That's why we've been telling everybody that this opposition of, uh, of Mars this year was the best you're going to get until 2035 for another 15 years. Um, they start getting smaller again as time moves on, uh, but enjoy it whilst we can because it's just going to get smaller and smaller. Now, if you've got a, a large enough telescope and you've got good uh, viewing conditions, uh, you should be able to see some of the darker markings on the uh, on the planet through your telescope. And if you'd like to be able to know what those features are that you're seeing on uh, on Mars, um, Sky and Telescope magazine uh, has a website listed down here. I uh, just put a Sky and Telescope Mars profiler into your search engine and you find it straight away. And by giving it the um, your location, the date and time, uh, you'll be able to get a, a a diagram which shows you exactly which face uh, of which part of Mars you're looking at at that very uh, at that very moment. So a really good useful tool to uh, to have. Now as I as I said, viewing conditions can vary um, and this I think shows it really really well. Two pictures of Mars taken very, very close together because they are showing the same face of Mars. This under exceptionally good, steady scene where the atmosphere above you on the telescope is really steady and stable, uh, whereas this is taken under still what would be very good conditions but nowhere near as good as this. Seeing detail on the planets, whether it be Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn, you want the best conditions that you can possibly uh, you can possibly get. All right, we now uh, for those of you that are insomniacs and or rise very early uh, on the thirteenth of November, go outside first thing in the morning before the sun rises, and you'll be able to see a crescent moon and the planet Venus low in the uh, in the eastern sky. Um, again, we'll uh, we'll bring in our binocular view, and uh, there they are, uh, Venus um, and the thin, whack, uh, waning uh, moon heading towards uh, a new moon uh, in a in a couple of days' uh, time. I think new moon is on the sixteenth uh, this month, so three days before uh, before new. But you need to get out there uh, before the sun rises. All right, one of the other interesting things for you to look at uh, this month, and this works really well because unlike the last few years, uh, this happens at a time when there's no moon in the sky. Um, so it's nice and dark, and that allows you to see many more of these uh, meteors or shooting stars. The Leonid meteor shower, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, why it's called the Leonid meteor shower in a, uh, in a minute. A meteor shower is when you, ha you happen to see a number of meteors or shooting stars, as they flash from the sky, they seem to come from the same point of view. Uh, we call that the radiant. That's where they're coming, they're coming from. And what are meteors? Meteors, are for the most part, are made up of the debris that's been left behind by comets. Comets are dirty snowballs made up of gravel, uh, small rocks, dust, all frozen together um, in ice. And as they come close to the sun, the sun's heat uh, heats them up. Uh, the, uh, the ice starts to uh, sublimate and uh, evaporate and uh, releasing some of that debris, and that gets left behind. There's a picture of a of a comet in the night sky. Actually, that was Comet Neowise, which was uh, visible for the Northern Hemisphere observers uh, at least really, really well uh, just a couple of months back. 
And the material that we see that we see from the Leonid meteor shower is associated with what's left behind by Comet Temple Tuttle. It orbits the sun every 33 uh, every 33 years. And here's a diagram. Uh, uh, this is the path of the comet through our solar system, and you can see the big uh, debris trail that it leaves uh, behind. And Earth just happens to run straight through that debris trail every year at this time of uh, this time of the year. Uh, the orbit of the comet uh, takes it. It just passed the orbit of uh, uh, Uranus. It takes 33 years to to make that uh, that that orbit. And as it comes in uh, to our part of the solar system, as I said, the sun heats it up. It releases some of that debris, replenishes that that debris field. And when the Earth goes uh, goes through it every, especially every 33 years, we get a really really nice big shower. Uh, the last one we had was in 2001, and uh, the the seeing of well seeing that meteor shower back in 2001 uh, is probably one of the highlights um, that I could uh, I could count on uh, just the fingers on one hand of the most spectacular things I've ever seen in the night sky. Uh, one of them was when uh, Jupiter got hit by a comet. Um, and the Leonid meteor shower, which I saw in November 2001, uh, will always remind, remain in my mind as one of the most spectacular fireworks display I've ever, ever seen. I was still seeing meteors streaming across the sky um, when the sun was just about coming up. Um, it was one of the most amazing sights uh, I'll, I'll never, ever forget. Uh, this year... Uh, unfortunately, is not going to be as good. You know, uh, back in 2001, I, I think I was probably seeing hundreds of meteors per, per minute. Um, this year, uh, probably 15 to 20 per hour. Um, but it does make it easier because there's no moon um, in, the morning, uh, in the morning sky um, this year. So what's the best way of being able to see some, uh, uh, some meteors? They, they will all seem to come from low in the eastern sky, and I'll show you a star map in a minute uh, to show you where it is. Um, low in the eastern sky. So make sure that you've got a nice clear view to the, uh, to the east. Uh, make sure your, your sky's that dark. So if you're sitting in, in a suburban area, go in the backyard somewhere where you're, you're shaded from street lights and, and everything. If you can get away uh, into the country to have a look, even better. Uh, you, you will need to get up early or not go to bed because uh, the best time to watch is around about 4 a.m. Um, on the 18th of November. Um, the night that we saw them back in 2001, uh, the shower wasn't due to start till about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but they, we started seeing uh, meteors by just after 1 o'clock. Uh, and that fireworks display continued until after the sun had, uh, had risen and get yourself a nice lounge chair that you can uh, sort of lie down on it um, and uh, and relax uh, put a put a rug over yourself to keep warm and uh, and have a look so where are you going to be looking if you look low to the east northeast uh, you'll see the constellation of leo the lion uh, rising um, Regulus is the uh, probably the the best point of reference that you could uh, you could use. It'll be the brightest star in, in that part of the sky, um, and the arrow is pointing to the area where they the meteors uh, seem to come from. Now, of course, they won't come from just from that point. Uh, the debris uh, field is quite large, uh, but they will all seem to radiate from around about there somewhere so have a have a good look at uh, at that keep warm just lie down and a nice uh, nice lazy uh, lazy boy and uh, and have a look hopefully it's a clear night for you but i can't promise you that you'll see the fireworks display that i remember seeing um, we saw this uh, uh chart earlier uh, there was mars 
and a Pegasus, the winged horse over here. Here's the great square of, uh, of Pegasus. There is his long neck. There's his front legs. There's one of his hind legs uh, down here. And uh, if you can't picture that, let me help you. Uh, well, I'll tell you about what that arrow is pointing at in a second. Here we go. There's the winged horse, a Pegasus. You can all see him now, can't you? That's easy. Uh, down here is the constellation of Andromeda. Uh, Andromeda, uh, the, the figure uh, shares uh, some of its uh, shape with the hind legs of uh, uh, Pegasus and also forms the figure of Andromeda, who was the wife of, uh, of uh, Perseus in uh, Greek, uh, Greek mythology. Over here, we've got Taurus the bull that we spoke about earlier. And just outside of the picture, uh, we've got uh, Orion, the uh, the mighty hunter, uh, just over uh, just over here. Now let's go back to uh, this arrow. As I said, this is called the Great Square of, of Pegasus, because it's nice, easy to find in the sky, and uh, you need to find that one so you can sort of skywalk yourself from Alpha Traz over here down to this star down to Mirac, and then follow these stars here. Two, if you're in a dark sky, you'd see a little fuzzy spot just about there. From the city, you, you won't see it uh, with, the, uh, with the naked eye. You'll need to trace this area uh, with binoculars. So start over here with Alphatraz and move your way down here uh, until you come to this spot, and you'll find a little fuzzy fuzzy spot. Um, in that, that area. And that fuzzy spot is labelled M31, which I mentioned to you before was the Andromeda Galaxy. Andromeda Galaxy is two and a half million light years away. Let's just bring it up. Now, you'll never see the moon near the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, the moon doesn't follow a path anywhere near there. but uh, the chap that uh, produced this image actually superimposed the the moon actual size compared to the Andromeda galaxy in our sky. So you can see that the Andromeda galaxy is around about six times uh, the size of the the moon in our uh, in our sky. Um, so you will definitely need a pair of binoculars in order to be able to see the full length of the uh, the galaxy. Uh, a telescope will only show you a very tiny, uh, tiny portion of it. Um, as I started to say, two and a half million light years away. So that little laser of mine would have to be very, very busy and very tired by the time they got to um, the Andromeda galaxy in two and a half million years. It's similar in size to our own Milky Way galaxy and our own Milky Way galaxy, should we be able to travel outside of it, uh, and far enough, would probably look something like uh, this, a beautiful spiral uh, spiral galaxy. Easily seen with the naked eye, if you're in the country in a dark uh, in a dark sky, the Andromeda galaxy is always one of the targets for everybody uh, who goes to the Vic South uh, Star Party at Little Desert Nature Lodge. As I said, uh, its apparent size in the sky is about six times that of the the full moon. And one of the things that I need to tell you, although I don't want you to lose any sleep over it, but both the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are traveling towards each other and they will collide in about 3 billion years or so. So don't lose any sleep just, uh, just yet. We don't have time to talk about exactly what will happen when, uh, when they do collide, but, uh, even if I was there, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't worry. We might as well stay in the same part of the sky. And the red arrow here is now pointing to something called M33. This is another galaxy. Again, something that looks fairly similar to uh, our own uh, our own galaxy. Again, a good target for your uh, for your binoculars. And here she comes. Uh, Unlike Andromeda, which is uh, quite uh, tilted to us, 
Um, this one has only got a slight uh, slight tilt, so we almost uh, see it face on. You can see the centre of the galaxy here, and here are the spiral arms, uh, almost like a like a spinning Catherine wheel. Absolutely gorgeous. However, uh, those two aren't the only two galaxies that we can see with the naked eye um, in our uh, nighttime uh, uh, nighttime sky. If you instead of looking north, if you turn around and look to the south, uh, high in the south, and just assuming you're in a dark sky and you've got uh, you've got clear skies, you'll see two little patches, bright patches in the sky that look like clouds. Uh, they are actually external galaxies. They're satellite galaxies of our own Milky Way galaxy, and they're called the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, they're named after Ferdinand Magellan, the Portuguese explorer who first saw them uh, when he was travelling the uh, the South Pacific uh, back in the late 1400s, early uh, 1500s. Let's have a look at each one in uh, in turn. Actually, I think I've got a photo that shows both of them. Here we go. Um, here's the large cloud, and here's the smaller cloud, and this object here we'll talk about as well. Unrelated, these two, uh, just in the same line of uh, same line of sight. This is the large cloud, and this is the the small cloud. So let's go back to the large cloud over uh, over here, and there's a close up uh, image of it. It's a, as I said, it's a satellite galaxy of our own Milky Way galaxy. Unlike Andromeda, which is two and a half million light years away, um, this one is only 158,000 light years away, so much, much closer. It's got a diameter of about 14,000 uh, light years. There's about a billion stars estimated to, to form um, this galaxy. And to give you an idea of, of the apparent size in the sky, it's about 20 times uh, a full moon, so it's a very large, uh, very large object. You won't even fit that uh, in your uh, binocular um, field of view. And just like the Andromeda Galaxy, <laughs> the Large Magellanic Cloud will also collide with our Milky Way Galaxy before Andromeda gets here in about 2.4 billion uh, years. Uh, both the large and the small cloud are being eaten up by the uh, Milky Way galaxy, and astronomers uh, have noticed that there is uh, bridges of, of gas and stray stars already uh, joining um, the large and small Magellanic clouds to our own Milky Way uh, galaxy. Our Milky Way galaxy has been a cannibal. Let's go to the small one now. This one is a slightly smaller, only about in the sky, about 10 times the size of uh, the full moon. So you, you still only just barely get it within the field of view of your uh, uh, binoculars. Uh, binoculars normally have a field of view of about seven degrees. Uh, the apparent size in the sky of the small cloud uh, on the long edge or long end uh, is about five and a half degrees. So you just fill that in into your binocular field of view. Um, this one is slightly further away at 199,000 light years. It's about half the size of the uh, uh, large cloud and it's estimated to contain around about 200 million uh, stars. The other object in this field is this one here. As I said, it's not related to the small cloud at all. They just happen to lie in the same line of, uh, line of sight. That one there is 47 Takani, or by its catalog number, NGC 104. It's a globular cluster. A globular cluster did you, is a... Did you, yeah. Sorry, Joe, I was Mark, just going to say, did you explain to them what the NGC stands for? I, I was I just, was did you explain to, to them what NGC stands for? No, but I was going to. Um. Ah. <laughs> the, there are I'll leave it with numbers. you. Uh, yes. Um, remember before, and I, I thought about explaining the M numbers earlier with M31 for the um, Andromeda galaxy and M33 for the other galaxy in uh, Triangulum. Uh, they are 
uh, catalogues that astronomers use and the M numbers uh, were items that were catalogued by a French astronomer uh, back in the late 1700s called Charles Messier, who was actually making up a catalogue of objects that he could exclude as being comets because he was a comet hunter. So he made up this catalogue of 110 odd objects that if you came across it, you knew that it wasn't a comet. So you could just leave it alone and not worry about it and keep on your search for uh, for comets. Uh, now there is another catalogue which is uh, created much, much later and has many, many more objects in it called the New General Catalogue. And this object here has an NGC number of 104. So it's 104th object within the NGC uh, catalogue. And this object is not a galaxy, is actually a globular cluster. It's not a cloud of gas. It's a big ball of, of stars. Um, contains probably between one and two million, uh, two million stars, all arranged in a ball. And there's a group of these globular clusters that form a halo around the centre of our galaxy. Um, I think it's around about 120, 130 of these uh, of these objects. Uh, this one is the second brightest one in the in the sky. Omega Centauri um, in Centaurus um, is the brightest one. So here in the southern hemisphere, we have the two brightest objects, uh, two brightest globular clusters in the whole sky for us to uh, for us to look at. And if we get lucky tonight, um, one of our people with a uh, waiting outside patiently with a telescope might be able to show us Omega Centauri. Oh, sorry, forty-seven Tuck um, through the uh, uh, through the telescope. Easily seen with a naked eye, um, as long as you've got a relatively uh, dark uh, a dark area to to look from. Um, even at that alone is nearly twice the size of the, of the full moon. So it's quite a spectacular object to uh, to look at. Anyway, I've just looked at the time. Gosh, I can talk. I've, uh, I know. I've just noticed it's nine thirty. I've, I've used up more time than I was uh, I was allowed. So I think I will finish there. <laughs> um, right. One of the things I should tell you, should tell everybody though is these star charts that you see in the background that I've been using all evening were created with a a software package called Stellarium. Um, it's free. Uh, just put, put Stellarium into your search engine. You'll find it. You'll be able to download a version of it, whether you're using uh, Linux, whether you're using a Mac, a Windows machine. Um, download it, install it on your computer, and you can generate uh, charts like this um, at your heart's, uh, heart's content. So I'll finish that now. If That's there are any more program. questions, Mark, um, mm -hmm. certainly uh, put them through, through to me. And I'll just... Uh, we will, through, as, as we look at the objects, people will ask questions and we will pop them up and uh, we'll get everybody to answer as best they can. So I'm going to bring uh, Perry into the chat. Good evening, Perry. How are you going? Hello, Mark. Hello, Joe. Good to see you Hello, again. Perry. Uh, did did you see, mate? I did it specially for you. I put M thirty one in the uh, in the list of objects. Beautiful. <laughs> I thought Perry, Perry would never forgive me if I don't include the Andromeda Galaxy. In yeah, it's a little bit easier to see for you guys, though, in uh, South Australia because you're a little bit further north. For exactly. Us. Down here in Melbourne, it's a little bit lower in the sky, so it makes it even more difficult. So I envy you and your skies in Adelaide. Now, I, I believe that uh, we've got people out there with the telescopes uh, all waiting to show it. We've got some. We'll bring them, we'll bring everybody in for the moment. I think that's everybody. Andy's hiding in the background somewhere, he's not quite there. Perry, I'm just going to pop you back off and bring you back in because your audio was a little bit out with your video. So I'm going to see if that helps. I'll try and do that. There we go. 
So we've got Noel from the AST. Uh, we've got Kim, who's from the Astronomical Society of South Australia, and Paul as well, who's from the ASSA. Paul's going to give us a talk yeah. tomorrow on planetary processing, and Perry from the ASV as well. Um, so Kim and Paul, I know you guys have clear sky at the moment. Noel, do you have clear sky at the moment? Yeah, partially. It's, it's okay at the moment. Yeah. I, I might bring Paul. I might bring your all sky camera in for everyone to have a look uh, so that's your view right now out there you've got a little bit of cloud but you've got some clear sky by the looks of it actually actually can you just see that uh, line there on the in the middle of the screen there um, is that the ISS that's uh, there's there's start that Starlink going Starlink. across okay. yeah the infernal Starlink <laughs> the evil Starlink <laughs> so guys we have a yeah, so you can see that going over in the track so okay. yeah 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 we have a question from... Um, I've got a question. Okay. Well, Perry, you first, then I've got a question from one of our viewers. Thank you, Mark. Paul, could you please explain to everyone what Starlink actually is and why it's not... Okay. All right. There's, there's another group coming over now. Okay. So Starlink is um, Elon Musk's version of uh, broadband information technology and um, uh, uplink so that everyone across the planet apparently can have broadband. They're a group of satellites. You can see it's moved. there's one a group moving across uh, now. Yeah. They, uh, they typically look like a small train, like, a, you know, seven or eight, nine, ten dots travelling along together. Uh, the reason why you can see them as a line now is simply because um, this is a 20-second exposure. Um, but um, over... The uh, course of the last 18 months or so, there's um, been a significant number of them launched into space. There'll be around 40-something thousand of them eventually, um, with um, the idea being that um, they'll be uh, in a higher orbit, uh, so they won't be as easily visible. However, um, they are a bit of a problem for astronomers and for people like myself who do uh, deep, uh, deep space uh, astrophotography. So right now we're just seeing them them go passing across. They're typically visible at this time of night when uh, the uh, sun is um, you know below the horizon, but not not that far below the horizon. And you can, and as a result, you can see them moving through the uh, field of view. So I think that pretty much covers what Starlink are, other than them being uh, called infernal. <laughs> All right. So we have a question from uh, one of the ASV's Brazilian members. Sergio joined during mm -hmm. our, uh, our September star party and he wants to know if there's anything interesting for 2021 to observe when we come into the new year. Well, can I have a go first before anybody mm -hmm. else does? Hello, Sergio. Good to hear that we've got ASV members in Brazil. I'm going to give you something interesting to look forward to before the new year, in fact, just before Christmas, uh, a couple of days or so before Christmas this year, if you look at the western sky, you will see that Jupiter and Saturn will be incredibly close together. In fact, they will be so close together um, if your eyes are as bad as mine, they could possibly look like a single object. That's a, it's going to be pretty impressive, that one. Um, thankfully, we're yeah. out of lockdown, so we will be able to actually see that. Uh, just don't forget that it will be quite low in the sky, only it about 13 degrees above the horizon. But if you can manage to see them, both in the same field of view of an eyepiece, you'll be able to see the uh, Jupiter and its moons and the Saturn and its moons and the rings all in the same field of view of your eyepiece. I'm going to try. I'm sure there'll be a lot of astrophotographers or planetary images. Paul, you in particular, I'm sure you'll try and image that. Um, yeah, I, I um, um, I'm a bit intermittent with my planetary imaging now. Um, I've got to juggle time between uh, taking mega hours on uh, on uh, deep sky objects and uh, keeping my wife happy. <laughs> so, you know, spousal uh, uh, happiness is uh, a big, big part of the problem in there in these uh, 
in uh, in this astronomy caper. So um, I was going to, uh, I'm just going to pop on uh, an image. Uh, I'll share an image of um, IC5148 that I've just taken in hydrogen alpha. So I'm just sharing that up now. So can you see that there? That's uh, that's about 180 seconds uh, on this. Uh, it's a reasonably smallish um, planetary nebula. Um, sort of interesting object. Uh, it actually has, uh, in much deeper images, uh, a very broad um, halo that surrounds it in O3. So uh, if you've got a, an O3 filter, you can sometimes... Um, catch a, a, a small glimpse of it but um uh this is um this is the mainly what you'll see when you look at it so that's uh 5148 ic 5148 planetary nebula looking exactly uh you know for almost face on the core stars here uh there's a bit of a slight torus around the outside so um yeah i still Dumb people like me, Paul, what an sure. filter is and what it does. Okay, uh, so uh, so there, there's there's three main types of imaging filters. Um, it, it, well, actually, two main types: uh, broadband, which is uh, luminance, and red, green, and blue filters. And then there are narrowband filters, and there's a spectrum of uh, three main types of narrowband filters that most people use hydrogen alpha which uh, covers about 656 nanometers uh, so a very narrow field of uh, 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 light passes through um, in hydrogen alpha and um, that mainly uh, uh, captures hydrogen um, uh, light and all that sort of thing um, and photons uh, then there's O3, which is uh, oxygen three. Uh, again, uh, mainly in the blue spectrum, um, but uh, a very narrow uh, uh, bandwidth. But O3 is um, is uh, very faint and very hard to to detect, and so it requires quite a uh, quite narrow band. So most of these filters that I have are, are around somewhere between six and five nanometers. Uh, a few of them are around three, nano, uh, three nanometers. Um, and S2, of course, is the last of the uh, narrowband filters that are commonly used, and that's for sulfur too. Uh, and the, the two and the three in the uh, alpha, alpha is obviously, that's pretty obvious. Uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, oxygen three is just uh, oxygen, the actual third uh, ionized oxygen. Um, and uh, sulfur too as well. Does that, does that help? Very good. It does, and it's probably worth pointing out that these filters also work well for visual astronomy, and you can also get what we call light pollution filters. Um, mm -hmm. I use one made by the Orion company called the Orion Ultrablock. So if you're in the city and you've got a lot of lights around you, some of these light pollution filters can help you to get better views of nebulae, not galaxies or planets, but gas clouds, nebulous gas yeah. clouds. You can get a better view of them, uh, even with strong lighting nearby. Mm. I'd, I'd yeah. like to point out, though, that uh, imaging filters are slightly different to visual filters. Um, it's yeah. highly unlikely you'd, you'd actually see through um, using a, an imaging filter to see through um, those filters with your eyes, whereas um, something like a, um, a high-contrast filter uh, used for, uh, say, looking at uh, planetary nebula, for instance, it's, got, it's, got, it's easier for the eye to see through it. So there's, there are slight yeah. differences, but, yeah, essentially that's correct, yeah. So we've got a, a um, so this is the spare tire nebula, isn't it? Yes, the, yeah, that's the spare tire nebula. And yeah, we were, I was joking earlier, guys, off on the, the private chat that we've got, obviously <laughs> with the program that it. Uh, I asked uh, Paul if it was a, a full size spare tire, if it was one of those space savers. We haven't quite worked that out. It kind of looks a bit like a space saver to me. 
Well, yeah. in my car, yeah. there's no spare of any size whatsoever. There's a little <laughs> can of stuff that pumps up your tyre and that's it. That's it. That's it. So someone that's someone right. made a, a comment yeah. there about... Um, someone made a comment there about... Um, thought it was uh, the Eye of God. No, that, that's a different one. That's the Helix Nebula. Uh, which we're going to, I'm going to try and get something for you in a little bit, but that's a much bigger nebula. That's uh, roughly speaking uh, around uh, the size of the moon, give or take, so as in uh, uh, apparent size. So this is much smaller again. That's very tiny. So maybe the, uh, the also, Paul, uh, Mark, or maybe Joe, maybe Joe can explain what planetary nebulae actually are. Joe, can you yeah. tell us about those? Oh. You're muted, Joe. You've got yourself muted. You're muted. You're muted, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. um, I was going to say, whilst I talk about the uh, planetary nebulae uh, for a second, perhaps we can start bringing him in. Uh, because yes. he, has, he has been imaging that NGC 104 popular cluster that I was telling you about earlier. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, so so uh, let's just talk about planetary nebulae. It's a completely misnomer. It's got nothing to do with planets whatsoever. It's just that many, many years ago, uh, before astronomers knew what they really were, it just reminded them of a, uh, of a planet. Uh, but it's actually the shell of gas that's been expelled by a star um, in the in the throes of uh, using up most of its nuclear fuel. Uh, the star sort of has a hiccup, and uh, this gas and uh, material spreads out from the star. And if we happen to see it face on, um, then uh, we'll see it as a a, a nice big spare tyre for you, Perry, <laughs> uh, or it may have a slightly different shape uh, uh, depending on our uh, angle of, uh, of view. Uh, but a planetary nebula has got nothing to do uh, with planets. It just resembles that, a, a small planet um, in, a, uh, in a telescope. Another thing about planetary nebulae is that many of them have a sort of... Um, powder blue colour to them and it can be quite striking when you see it through a telescope. Um, they can be some of the few objects that actually display a strong, well, even though it's pale, it's still a visible colour that you can see in a, a reasonable size telescope and worth noting it when you do have a look. A good example is the blue planetary just uh, near the Southern Cross. Uh, yes, that shows up in really deep blue. All right, let's hand over to Kim because I think that's his telescope there. Thanks, what are you going to show? I'll just talk to this. I'll just talk to a couple of slides first, just describing the equipment I've got, and then I'm going to show uh, some images which I've been taking real time from you not my backyard, but my front yard. Yeah, are you also going to tell us about your roses there, Kim? They're very impressive. <laughs> another day, uh, Perry, another day. <laughs> I refer to them as the presidential rose garden these days. <laughs> okay, um, so this is, a, um, this is a relatively small telescope, uh, and I'll describe, but it's uh, actually a highly advanced and I'll just quickly describe its features. Uh, that's a photo of the whole thing. Next slide, please. Uh, it's not, I'm not in presentation mode, of course. All right, so this is a close-up of the uh, uh, the whole uh, beast. And this is an 80, and I'll just go to this next slide. Okay, so this is an 80 millimeter refractor. It's a fluorite doublet made by William Optics. Now, I bought this telescope over 10 years ago as a visual telescope. And uh, over the last year or so, I decided, well, I'll convert it to an imaging scope. Um, the technology has advanced so much for imaging the night sky in recent years and, and even in, even during this year that I thought I'd buy a few cameras, um, advanced cameras and some advanced computers and see what I could do with it. 
very small scope in a light polluted um, part of Adelaide. It's Bortle 8, where I am. I'm not even five kilometres from the city centre. And I have a wonderful LED uh, street light hanging over this, which is probably no more than 15 metres away. Anyhow, from there, you can still image, which is pretty amazing. So this is what I've got. Okay, here's the aperture. It's a refractor. There's just one big, a uh, couple of big lenses in there. And uh, this is the camera down the back end here. And it's a special camera for taking astronomical images. It's also cooled. So you, the camera is currently operating at zero degrees C, but I can go a bit cooler. I've just let it go to zero tonight. There's a little camera on the back of this little telescope up here. That's called a guide scope, and that helps keep the images together with the camera. Um, uh, so the, the stars are pinpoint uh, during exposure. So any errors in tracking the night sky are uh, automatically uh, notified to the main camera by the little camera, sorry, and, but the little camera notifies the mount, which is below here, which then makes adjustments ever so slightly. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, there's an electronic focus on the other side of this. So um, telescope automatically focuses at, at certain times during the night. And there's a mount at the bottom here, which keeps it um, <laughs> pointing in the right direction. Um, and what else is there? Oh, this little box at the end here is, is just magic. I mean, this is a, essentially an a astronomical computer. It's actually a Raspberry Pi. This version has a power supply on it as well. Sorry, a number of 12-volt uh, power outlets, which feed uh, the electronic focuser. And also, um, what else is this feeding at the moment? It's feeding the hub. And uh, anyhow. This is a very versatile system, and I thought I'd try see what I can get with this, and I'll, I'll show you some images that I'm taking through this, and I'll do it in real time tonight. Uh, this is another shot of the, of the, the scope, and you can, here you can see the electronic focus on one side. Um, now, this particular mount is very versatile. I actually use it to mount not only one telescope, but two telescopes. Uh, that's the one on the left is the one I just showed, the small refractor, and this is a nine and a quarter inch uh, schmidt cassegrain system. And the idea behind this configuration at the time when I bought it in February this year, uh, meaning the mount, was so I can connect a camera to one of these and use the other one for visual at uh, public outreach events. That was just before COVID started getting serious. And uh, that, that hasn't actually been realised yet, but the capability is there. This is a very versatile system. You can use it with just the larger scope, and I've used that recently just for some planetary work. And this is it again in the front yard, um, just imaging. Uh, these are pretty well my first or actually second images I took of, the, of Mars and Saturn uh, a few weeks ago uh, through this setup. Planetary imaging is very, very challenging. Um, I'm happy with my initial results. I don't really know how to process the images properly. Um, I also like to do things on a Mac, a Mac computer. And um, uh, Software is a bit. Uh, there's a lot, the software is a lot more abundant on PC, so I'm still finding my way on that. Anyhow, that's what I wanted to show you there. I'll now show you that the, the computer. I mean, the telescope is out the front, and the computer is attached to it. I'm I'm sitting inside, as you probably guessed. So um, let me just hook up my my iPad. So this is a screen of my iPad right now. You can see that. Uh, I'm sharing it. That for you. There you go. Thanks, Mark. And that's an image I took of um, 47 Tucani, the globular cluster um, that Joe talked about earlier. And I've stopped imaging. I, was, I started imaging around the time Joe started talking. I thought I'd better stop, otherwise I'd burn out the uh, the frame. <laughs> um, but it ended up being a, a stack of 33 images, which you can see the numbers down here. Um, and I think they were 10 second, 10 second exposures each. So the image literally forms in front of your eyes when you, when you do this. Um, and uh, I'm connected wirelessly at the moment to the computer uh, on the telescope. I'll just get rid of the guide for a moment. And I'm just touching the iPad screen here. In fact, I can get rid of all that. And you can see, I can just zoom in and there's a, a lovely image of 47 can I that was literally taken from while I was sitting inside, the telescope's outside. All right, so now I'm going to take another image, and I'm going to I'm going to show you the process um, for taking an image of the Tarantula Nebula. Now that's a very large um, um, nebula in an adjoining galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, this this cluster here, this globular star cluster, is about thirteen thousand light years from us. 
The Large Magellanic Cloud is about 180,000 light years, but it's got this massive nebula associated with it. So I'm going to just show you the process for how one finds these objects and, and images them. I'll exit that. I'll just type in here, uh, I need NGC 2070, which is the um, object. I'll just type it in here, uh, NGC 2070. I might even have it here. Um, no, I don't see it there. Okay, so I'll just type it in. 2070, search, and there it is. So I'll just tap on it, choose. All right, so now the telescope is going to slew to that object. Now, one thing it does, we don't do star alignment with this package. We actually use a technique called plate solving. And what that means is the telescope will, and well, the computer will instruct the telescope to take a series of images very quickly and determine where it's actually pointing versus where it should be pointing and then make adjustments to the mount so the target is actually more or less in the center of the field of view. So I'll tell this to go now. So it started to move. So the telescope is slowing at the moment. And I can show you that uh, with another security camera that's out the front. Um, but it does, for some reason, it affects the volume um, on, um, on my computer here. So I, I won't activate the camera just yet. All right, so it's slowing to the target position, which shouldn't be very far. And when it gets there, it'll take an image. I'm just going to have a quick look on my phone to make sure it is actually getting there. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's there. And it's, it's, centered the, it's centered it, the target. And I'll just take a quick preview shot. That is not a good shot. I'll just clear it. All right, I'll just take a 10-second exposure on it, unless I'm looking at a street light. Hopefully we'll see something. Uh, auto. That's what I'm... Yeah. And there it is. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll start taking a series of images. Um, I'll just adjust the position slightly. It's a bit off center. Um, and this is a bit of a guessing game for anyone who's done this before. I'm just going to tap that one. I might go back to a place. Possible to point it out with it's a what? cursor. Is it possible for you to point it out with a cursor just so people know exactly what you're referring to? Sorry, I was using my fingers on the iPad screen. I'm po I'm po Can you see my cursor there, Perry? Mm, no. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, um, I can't do anything about that, I'm afraid. Okay, fair enough. If you centre it, it'll be the same thing. I'll, I'll try to centre it. Um, okay, I need to take another photo. Hold on. Uh, I'll just get it more or less centred, then I'll just start exposing. Wrong way. <laughs> All right. Take one more shot here. All right, that's, that's good enough for now. Okay, so center's there. It's a bit off center, just above. So um, so that's, um, that's basically one image. That's a five-second exposure. I'm going to now set this so we take a series of images, and I'll just let it run. So I'll go auto run. Um, no, I don't want to do flats. Go back. Actually, I'll do live. Can't delete that. Go back. I'll do live stacking. Um, so I've got live stacking. And what this will do is just take a series of images and keep putting them one on top of the other. I'll, I'll just keep them at 10 second exposures. And I'll just start now. And this will just keep um, taking images every ten, uh, 10 second exposures and then put them on top of each other like um, essentially a pancake. And uh, the image will gradually get better and better with time as more and more images are accumulated. Uh, data is accumulated. And so I'm just going to let this run for, I don't know, uh, 20 or 30 exposures. And uh, we can come back to it later if you like. You see some of the colour start to come out now after uh, two exposures. I'll just get rid of the Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this is much more fun than watching grass grow. 
Yeah, okay. That's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually watching the uh, the nebula get, uh, you know, brighter and more colourful uh, with, yep. uh, with every exposure. It's looking good. I'm not uh, – I just realised I'm not uh, guiding on it at the moment, but I don't think I need to. It's, it's pretty close. Uh, but maybe I should turn guiding on. Um, let's have a look here. I know that's okay. That's a guy. Guy. Yeah, what? Whilst we're watching that, that nebula, that big gas cloud get bigger and bigger in the picture, um, we're fortunate that that is um, 180,000 light years away uh, because if it was within our own Milky Way in our part of the, the galaxy, uh, that object uh, would occupy a third of the, the night sky and be visible in daytime. Uh, that is a huge cloud of gas and dust. New stars are forming inside there all the time. Oops, I'm just going back to the wrong part. Oh, okay, Kim, we've, got, we've got a question here for you. What's the focal length and effective f-stop of your telescope? <laughs> so there is a uh, focal reducer on that telescope. It's normally f6.9 uh, at 555 millimetres. Um, but with a reducer, it brings it down to 444 millimetres. So I think it's around F5 point, what did I say, 8, was it 7? No, it's around F5.6 uh, or something. So it's not that fast, but it's, um, as a refractor, it's a very, and, and as a fluorite doublet, actually the images, um, the star images are quite nice. There we go, wonderful. So we have um, Jen from the ASV up in Swan Hill, she is currently the only ASV member with clear sky that we, <laughs> she's got her camera hooked up. So um, while yours is stacking, um, Kim, I might chuck Jen's on. Yep, do that. We can have a look at what she's been. I'll bring Jen in as well. Yep. Hey, Jen, how are you going? Hi, guys. How are you? Uh, we were talking about this one earlier, weren't you, Kim? The... Um, the wonderful Helix Nebula. I'm currently taking five minutes in um, HA. There we go. So what's your equipment, Jen? Um, Skywatcher ED120 with an um, ASI 1600 mono camera. Now, Joe, did you want to tell us a little bit about Helix? Um, it's another one of those uh, planetary nebulae that we were talking about uh, earlier. Um, as Paul said, uh, uh, this one, uh, the helix, is much, much bigger um, than uh, IC5148 that he showed us earlier. Uh, the apparent size of this in the sky is bigger than the full moon. So it's, uh, it's an object uh, whose uh, shell of gas has been expanding for a, a long, long time. Um, so this, this is the is uh, to say, this is the 18 inch mag wheel version. This is not the uh, space saving spare tire. Hmm. Yes, exactly, exactly right. Uh, exactly right. That is uh, <laughs> because it's so large. Uh, its light is spread over a large area. Uh, therefore, it's a lot more difficult to see than some of the smaller planetary nebulae. Uh, where the light's concentrated into a small area and therefore brighter. Uh, so you really, you really do need a dark sky um, and good contrast um, in your telescope for you to be able to see this visually. Uh, you know, when uh, people like Jen or uh, Paul are uh, imaging it, the end result is absolutely spectacular. Uh, but don't ever expect that you'll see the same thing when you're looking at it through a telescope with your eye. Yeah, it would just be a very faint wisps of uh, of cloud um, in uh, in the eyepiece. But uh, when you know what it is, it's still spectacular. It is. So Andy, yeah. you're hiding. I was, I was, you go, Perry, and then I'll just. I've got. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, the other thing I was going to point out, and unfortunately, I can't enlarged in image of it, but usually in the centre of these objects, you can find the progenitor star. In other words, 
We'll start the day birth. There we go. Can you point to it, please, Jen? Or is it Mark? Whoever's got in the middle? No, it's Jen with the mouse. It's the one in the middle, isn't it? The one in the middle. The one in the middle. That's yes. It. So what's left of the of the star about the size of our sun is now uh, just a small. A small example of itself because it pushed the outer layers of its atmosphere out into space when it's reached, as Joe said earlier, when it reaches the final stages of its life. So this is basically a look into the future of our sun because that's what will happen to our sun. It's not going to go supernova, as some people may have thought, because it doesn't have enough material, enough mass to do that. Uh, it needs to be about 10 times uh, the mass of the sun for a star to go supernova. So anything about the size of our sun does this sort of thing at the end of its life, just pushes out the outer layers of its atmosphere into space and what's left is uh, the hot core of the sun. So we've got... <laughs> I muted Jen for a second because she was getting some reverb and her sound was up a bit too high. <laughs> That's a bit better. So we've got a question, Perry, which kind of leads on to what you're talking about there. Um, David wants to know, do you ever get to see the, the white dwarf core of a planetary nebula or are they too small? Um, this, well, this sort of is a white dwarf, but there are some examples that you can see in the sky, but you need to have um, a sizable instrument with enough uh, if you're looking at it visually, that is, not photographically, um, all bets are off when you use cameras because cameras can uh, take long exposures, whereas the eye has to immediately see whatever it can in the eyepiece. Although there are techniques that you can use visually to improve what you're actually seeing in the eyepiece, but they might be something for a, a different time to have a talk about that. But there are some white dwarfs that are uh, visible in telescopes with your eye. Uh, another one is the pup, which is the companion to the dog star Sirius. Currently, well, over the last uh, few decades, those two stars have been very close together, but for about the last five to ten years, they've been separating and they're a little bit easier to see in a telescope, but you still need to have a, a night of very good steady seeing and enough firepower in your telescope, plus some visual observing techniques that you can use in order to be able to see it. So that's a complicated answer where, in fact, I could have just said yes. <laughs> that's all right. So Paul's just let us know. He's got a, um, uh, a high-res version or a, what'd you say? Oh, hang on, we'll bring Paul in. We'll put that straight Yeah, it's a, yeah, a high-res high version of, um, of the Helix. So I just... Um, uh, this is slightly longer focal length of what Jen's working with. Uh, I'm using a 12 inch um, uh, uh, Orion Optics uh, telescope, a uh, Newtonian uh, telescope with a 683. It's a monochrome image of uh, in luminance. But uh, of interest, uh, I think, with the image is um, you can see the cometary uh, globular nod nodules that are uh, contained within the nebula. Um, and they're um, they're like little spots radiating outwards, and you can see that further around on the outside, when the brighter section, you can see that there's these radiations uh, of the uh, 
of the nebula. Now, as you image that further and further with, um, in, uh, and this is a hydrogen alpha, sorry, not luminance, so in hydrogen alpha, uh, you'll get, uh, there's actually six distinct shells that can be seen of this nebula uh, further and further out. So this, this is only just uh, 270 minutes so far, but um, uh, I, I did an image project uh, on this object a couple of years back where I did 111 hours, and you could see right out to the outer all? chevrons here. Yeah, only that all, hours. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> Um, it was, uh, it's a sort of, uh, uh, one of the pet objects of mine, I guess. So, uh, but, um, I thought, yeah, Jen's object is very, very good for, for the, uh, for the size of refractor and shows you what you can get with a, with a refractor. Um, but, um, of course you can always go bigger and bigger, um, with, um, with a bit more image scale. So, uh, one of my favorite objects in the sky, that's for sure. Getting back to those cometary globules that you were talking about earlier, Paul, they always kind of remind me of a bicycle uh, wheel with the spokes coming away from the central hub. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it sort of interesting how that object looks. It is. It's a beautiful object to, to look at. This is um, a colour version that Andy has um, been working on over the last few nights. He's got cloud at the moment, so this is one of his previous images. What, what are you using to get your images, Andy? Uh, good day, everyone. Um, it's just a Skywatcher 150mm Newtonian um, with a old Canon EOS 450D. Um, it's been modified. Um, I'm just going through uh, Canon EOS at the moment. Um, just a few tick. Uh, back to here. Find it. Yeah, I'm just sort of going through some of my images now, and I've just noticed a uh, a satellite going through this one. That was um, a couple of nights ago. So they just so these are my beams I'm sort of stacking at the moment. Um, yeah, that's a yeah, just simple equipment. Um, just a, a you know a simple or six inch Newtonian um, guided and uh, on a with a Canon 450D. How long are your exposures for these? Uh, these are five minutes, three hundred seconds, um, and. Uh, I don't know if you can see the details here. Yeah, 300 seconds, 10 degrees. Yep. Oh, there it is in the corner, yeah. Andy, can I ask a question? Yep. For, you said very simple equipment. Can you please tell everyone how much your very simple equipment costs? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably about under a thousand. <laughs> right. What I'll do, I'll, I'll show well, you a picture of my what? For what? second hand. Um, for what? Just, for what? Yeah. Uh, for my scope, mount, uh, and camera. Um, yeah, so That's I got very good scope, line. $200, a $200 scope. Um, here it is here. I don't know if you can see that, guys. Uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a, it cost me two hundred dollars second having second hand. My camera cost me two hundred and twenty dollars, um, and my mount was seven hundred dollars. So that yeah, mount, probably eleven hundred dollars. And what about and then, that beautiful portable shower in the background? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's where that's my imaging tent. That's um, where that's where he yeah. sits when we do streaming, Perry. That's that's exactly <laughs> where he's sitting when he does his live streams with us with his image. That's it. And that's I've got a video there. there. Um, but at the moment I'm in my room <laughs> because it's it's just not even worth sitting out there at the moment. So um So Andy's um AD wants to know what software package were you using there? Uh backyard EOS. Um it's just a program. I think it's about, oh, it's pretty cheap, 50 bucks, I think. Um, 
Might even be less. But you can use the free version. Um, but this is a backyard EOS, and then I mainly use. Um, after that, I'll run it through Astro Pixel processor um, to stack it. I've tried Deep Sky Stacker, but pretty well just by um, capturing software's backyard EOS. Um, and yeah, I'm, so I've, I've just bought second hand gear and pretend <laughs> and just use cheap software. And uh, but Astro Pixel Process, I think that's another 20 bucks a year, maybe a bit more. I'm not too sure because it's a more of a yearly rental. Um, and uh, and then Photoshop, which costs a bit more, of course. Um, you've, done, you've done very well, Andy, because I know people that have spent as much as $20,000 on Astro Photographic systems. And the rest. Yeah. And the rest. <laughs> Who said that? A, lot more. A, a lot more. Me. A lot more. Um, lots, lots, lots. Hang on. And are you still married? Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. <laughs> my wife uh, is very accommodating of my obsession. <laughs> so what sort of deal with the devil have you struck to be able to convince your wife to do that? Uh, I can't really tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just quickly um, did you sacrifice an astrologer maybe or something <laughs> no, no, astrologer. Um, Andy so Lee wants to know um, is the 450D altered with the IR filter removed yes it is yes that's that's been that's it's been removed yes and you've, you've um, butchered it but I've also bought a few okay, I'm sort of looking here yeah, I forgot about my guy camera. Yeah, that was two hundred bucks. <laughs> it sort of it starts adding up, and then you're cabling and and, for, and then all that. You know, it's not as cheap as you yeah. initially said. No, so. no, and then you. <laughs> but still, it's it's because I bought everything secondhand. New, yeah, it would have been in the, about two thousand bucks worth, roughly. Um, but the, it, I think what my uh, main um. Luck is, is having border one skies. I think that's my um, that helps a lot. Um, you know, you I'm not filtering anything. The only time I put, put my um, I bought a hydrogen alpha filter, I put that on only when the moon's up pretty well. Um, just for and I've, I've done a little bit of it, um, HA, but um, pretty well. So then the other, the other simple question. Gear. The other question is, where do you find your second-hand gear? Uh, I, I found mine mostly on Ice and Space. Um, it's a pretty well in the second-hand gear. Um, it was a while ago, and I just kept on watching until I found something at the right price and just went for it straight away. I mean, I, Gavin's the I, least I, patient I, person I know. He won't sit and watch anything. He'll end up just buying it new. Yeah. So, yeah. Kim, I mean, Kim, your um, your tarantula nebula stack is looking um, quite impressive. Uh, but, and actually, maybe this might be an opportune moment to talk about why it's called the tarantula. Joe, do you want to have a go at that? Uh, you raise the subject. You do. It. I always <laughs> thought it was because it looked like a, de a dead spider on its back with its well, legs. It's, uh, yes, it's those spindly legs and loops uh, are all representing the daddy long leg sort of shape of uh, some spiders, really. It's a, a beautiful object to look at. And, um, I, I know when we put the O3 filter on, it looks even better. Pops. Yes, um, I agree. Visual, visually speaking, when you look at that with the O3 on, it just it almost looks 3D um, through a good scope. Yeah. I can. Uh, Joe talked about when he first saw Saturn. I can remember the first time I saw the tarantula. Um, I had an eight-inch telescope, and uh, 
looking at it from a dark sky site. I've never seen it before, but as soon as I saw it, I knew immediately what it was, and I was just knocked out. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I think the first time I saw it was through the 25-inch at the Dark Sky site. So I was a bit spoiled. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was um, quite a sight to see uh, through that telescope, that's for sure. The other thing to note, if uh, you ever have the opportunity, if you're a member of the public, to have a look at the tarantula, you will see all around it lots of other little bits of nebulosity because the Magellanic Cloud has, um, well, first of all, as Joe said earlier, it's about 160,000 light years away, but there's other little bits of nebulae all the way around the cloud. So if you move the scope slightly to the left or to the right, you pick up lots of other little bits of gas that are part of this um, galaxy. So just quickly, Kim's having some trouble with his audio, but he's let us know he's going to, um, you know, we're going to do a live slew uh, to, uh, what do you say, it, uh, to Pluto. Let's see if Perry can pick it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be a cinch, no problem. <laughs> yeah, here we go, Kim. We've got that back up. So here we go. Kim's camera is going to slew. So this is um so yeah, you're pointing he's pointing to where it is between Jupiter and Saturn there, those two stars in the uh top left corner of the screen. And uh we're going to there it goes, look at it move. It's alive! It's it alive! Is. I think I need to get Blake one of these little um, cameras. He needs one so he can sit inside and watch his camera slew when it moves around. It's That's uh, quite a magic thing to watch. I know it's just a simple thing, but to see it actually move to the object. Now, Kim, you have to uh, take some images of Pluto and point it out to us. You know that. Everyone's going to want that. <laughs> the level of expectation has been raised. <laughs> uh, might I temper everyone's expectations a little yeah, bit? You, you better. It'll look just like a very faint star. No different to all the other faint stars in there. I think if Kim's audio was uh, working, he would tell us that the way to confirm the object is to take a photograph tonight and then tomorrow night or perhaps the night after, take another photograph of the same part of the sky and watch or look to see which one of those stars has moved slightly. And that will be Pluto. And in fact, that was how Pluto was discovered back in 1930. All right, Perry, my, I got my sound back. For some reason, when my security camera is on, my audio gets whacked. So can oh. you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, so that's exactly what I'll do. I'll take a series of images tonight and stack them, and then tomorrow night I'll take another series of images, and you'll be able to see the um, the, the, the pixel that is Pluto. I was going to say <laughs> planet. Let's call it a pixel. Uh, yeah. Jump. <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to do this will be a continuation tomorrow night. So everyone who's watching yeah, so now, if you come back tomorrow night, um, we'll be able to show you the difference between tonight's images and tomorrow night's images and then work out which one of those stars has moved and therefore we can work out which one is Pluto. Is that? That's a bit of light in the bottom corner of your photo there, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know where that's coming from. I think um, I know I saw a car drive off just on the video. So no, that's that. That's a bright, that's a flare, that's a bright star from a really bright star. Could be Jupiter, could be Jupiter. Could be Jupiter. that's just that side of the field of view. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say it's yeah. an annoying right. next door neighbour. So I'll, I'll, I'll start stacking here and uh, you can move on to another top, topic while I set up for this. 
So what have we got? I think Andy said he's got a co- an image of tarantula that he took from last week. If you want to get that up, Andy, if it's the one I think it is. <laughs> oh, it's ready. Here we go. This is Andy's image of tarantula from last Saturday. It's a pretty oh, detailed very image. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, can really, you can really see the spider shape in it now, can't you? Uh, tell you what, the spiders for that big. That, that is absolute astronomer humour, that one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they can look that big sometimes too. Oh. Yeah, they can. <laughs> Mark, everyone keeps telling me not to give up my night job. What's that? Oh, of astronomy, yeah. Yes, and I, I get that one. Too. I get the day job one as well. Yeah, dad jokes and all it goes hand in hand with astronomy. I think. Yep, that was a good, good, fun, fun week, fun night on uh, last Saturday on Halloween, and a lot of people got dressed up, and it was it yeah, was uh, Noel had the uh, Noel was Noel, Noel turned up as Uncle Fester. That was probably the best. I think I feel like I let the team down. Just I just had an axe in my head. And that was it. <laughs> so um, while Kim's doing what he's doing, we might uh, Jen. Have you continued to stack your images of Helix? She's on. Hang on, I've got to unmute yeah, you. No. There we go. Up to is me, that, eighth frame. Uh, and is it live stacking? Yeah. No, it doesn't stack live, no. Oh, okay. So you've still got the same frame going. Yeah. Got, yeah. We might just quickly jump back that to that for a moment while Kim does what he needs to do. So this is our our glorious Helix Nebula. And unfortunately, I think Noel and Andy are clouded out, and I think Paul mentioned he was clouded out as well. Oh, so wow. We're, we're relying on yourself and um, Kim at the moment to uh, bring <laughs> us some images. Okay. And there we go. So, try and bring that back to where I am. I lost you guys for a second there. Is so, it possible to enlarge that image? I'm not sure whether you can do it or Jen has to do it. Jen, Jen will have to do that, yeah. Yeah. So you're zooming in there, I think. Yep. Um, one of the one of the things about the tarantula, sorry, uh, about the helix nebula, is if you've got uh, a large enough telescope, or you take a long enough exposure or do enough stacks, you can see, you can make out some fainter, more distant objects, usually galaxies, behind those wisps of gas. Wow. Let's, uh, there you go. This is, there's another new thing on Yeah, there are, there are quite a lot there. Yeah, that's a, something new I've learned, that's for sure. Wonderful fact. Very interesting fact. I like that one. Now, Jen, there's your, your, your challenge. Stack, 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 and stack and find those galaxies. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you where a couple of them are, Jen. If you yep. can imagine the helix as we're looking at it right now as, uh, let's say, a Aussie rules oval. Do you know where the goalposts would be at either end? That's yeah. where you have to look. Okay. Uh -huh. yep. Challenge has been thrown down. So just quickly, I just noticed a, a comment which pretty much sums up 2020 in the life of Pluto from uh, Lee. From planet to dwarf planet to pixel, 2020 has been a terrible for everyone, even our favourite distant neighbours. <laughs> we, have, we have relegated Pluto to a pixel. You poor little thing. Very could have been worse. It could, could have be been worse. just a dog. <laughs> could 
could have been just a dog, yes. So, Andy, I think you've got a um, star trail here for us to have a peek at. Where did you take this one? Uh, yeah, right next to my little tent. I've got a water tank there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just pretty well turned around and um, looking looking south. Um, I'm just trying to find a, a um, single image of that. Uh, got it somewhere. Um, no, right at the moment I cannot find it. <laughs> of course. Star trails, here we go. While while you're looking for Andy, yeah. I maybe somebody would like to explain what we're actually looking at. Okay. That's a an image. Um, it was probably about an hour and twenty minutes, thirty second exposures. I'm looking at the South Celestial Pole, which is right in the middle, um, and because the sky rotates around that, it, that's why the stars are, are streaking. They're, they're becoming trails, and then I've stacked all these on. Um, on top of each other, but kept the foreground static. Um, yeah, it's a nice image, that's for sure. So just yeah. quickly, Paul has um, graciously gone and dug up his lazy 111-hour um, helix nebula. Whoa. Oh, wow. Could, it, could have taken some. Could have taken some more time. Could have put some more effort into that one, Paul. That's, yeah, um, yeah I, I, think so. I think so too, Paul. Yeah, it only looks like a hundred and ten hours to me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, some some That's interesting really... things here. Like, um, uh, can you see my cursor at all? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. These outer chevrons here, they're, they're part of the original, the, the very first outbursts. And there's actually another chevron here that's very, very faint. Lots yeah, of galaxies in this field here. But also down here, there's there's some chev like a, a, a really long chevron coming out. And with more time, you, you get you get this data that, that starts to produce and, and show itself. This also contains hydrogen alpha, so you can see the striations coming out uh, from the core there. So that's why it, it people say it looks like the eye of God. You know, it, 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 it does really look like an eye, you know, it, the, even to the point where up here and around here might be the eyelids. It's a beautiful image, so much detail in Yep. Yep, it is. And the progenitor star now looks dead set in the middle of the pupil. The colour mm. of it is yeah. the blue of yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, it's a spectacular object. It really is. Even visually, it's quite interesting to look at. Um, so just for the galaxies, there's a galaxy off to the left here, just a small one, one of the ones that Perry can mentioned. You, can you zoom in on that one, Paul, because like, you can just make that out now that you've pointed it. Yeah, I, I can't go any, any. Oh, hang on. I'll try. Let's see what I can do here. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, so oh, there you go. You go a little bit bigger. Yeah, so there's a galaxy there. there. There's another one there. Another one here. And there's one over there, too. There's quite a few, isn't there? There are quite a few in this field, yeah. There's another nice another galaxy one. up here. Fuzzy there. Wow. Very impressive. I think I just saw another one down the bottom there as well. Oh, let's see. You, this one here, yes. Yeah. And this yeah. one here. One another there. small fuzzy there. A bit yeah. shifted these ones. One there. I'm Yep, I'm gr so grateful to you, Paul, for that because I was just making that stuff up. 
<laughs> don't, you make, don't you make everything up, Perry? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Usually people don't challenge me. That's <laughs> well, it's challenged? just as well that you're right. <laughs> yes. You were not left found wanting, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, I thought you uh, you might like to see that with the uh, mega hours. That's absolutely beautiful. I think um, I think Kimmy, you you're still stacking. You're you're taking your images, aren't you? I decided to stop after uh, thirty one images. I mean, the thirty one ten second images. You can bring it yeah, up on the I will, screen if I you will. like. And I think what we might. I'm sure there's a special prize for someone oh, can, who can I find can see that. It right now. Um, but I. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. It's, it's that pixel <laughs> yeah, right the there, one, right? The, the one there towards the. So, um, <laughs> so I'll. Uh, I'm sure it's in there somewhere, more or less in the centre. Uh, but I'll uh, take another image tomorrow night and somehow stack them and. So I think tomorrow them, night so we're speak. not going to have the cloud issues we've had tonight. That's for sure. Um, so tomorrow night looks like everyone's going to have clear skies, which will be very good, uh, and we'll be able to move through um quite a lot more objects than what we've been able to get through tonight with uh, everybody dealing with clouds in the southern and eastern states here so i think um yeah. might be worth sort of just winding it up for the evening uh and saving our energy for the clear skies tomorrow night we've got uh tomorrow morning paul at 11 o'clock paul will be presenting his uh present or doing a presentation on planetary imaging and processing and yep. we'll be following that at 12 30 with a talk from um, andy campbell on astrophotography uh processing so stick around for both of those as well and i, th I think from memory two o'clock we're going to do some solar observing with russell uh so really looking forward to that because russell's energy is is in completely infectious and it's always good to look at the sun and uh i believe there is still some active um, spots on the sun at the moment. Was I took some images with my phone and telescope the other uh, last week. Um, um, Mark, can I just pick you up on something? Yeah, um, yeah. Not, not so good to look at the sun without the right filters. True, true. I have a. I, I should clarify that I have a filter, special filter on the end of my of uh, of the eight-inch Dobsonian I use. So, and I always take the um, viewfinder off when I do it as well <laughs> or cover it up completely with a cloth so that there's no sunlight coming through that because you don't want to accidentally look through that either. Well, um, not only that, but if you've got a finder scope, uh, it'll, the sun will burn the crosshairs in it if you take the cap off because yeah. the sunlight is so intense, you'll have to get some new crosshairs. That's why I just take it off completely. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then I think following that, we've got Q&A or, or I'll probably get it wrong. Noel will pick me up on it. Uh, I believe it's Q&A. Yeah, quiz. quiz. It's a quiz, isn't it? It's a quiz first with Fraser uh, and then uh, the Q&A after that. And uh, so if you've got questions about space and astronomy and or anything to do with those topics, um, You'll be able to ask those questions direct during the Q&A session tomorrow, uh, late afternoon, early evening. Uh, and we're finishing off with another Sky for the Night with Perry tomorrow night, leading into Deep Sky. And Deep Sky tomorrow night, we're going to have wonderful clear skies. So we'll be able to look at planets live. We'll be able to look at some more deep sky objects, maybe some galaxies as well. Um, I think Kim's just got another helix he'd like to quickly show us before we finish so we'll finish on a, a live stack of helix that kim's been working on right now and let's add that to the stream there we go oh look at that Ooh. so i think that's just the first image and it's obviously trailed so i better put the guide on <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of oh, I'll I'll it. yeah i'll jump that one all right there you that's go. pretty that's pretty good from the city that's that's well, a really actually, faint object. Um, so you know, it's it's good from the city. Yeah, um, I, I'll just get the guiding going. Oh, that's going. Ad Adelaide. Adelaide's, that clear, Adelaide's not a city. It's a country town, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no, you know, we have one. We have one point three million people here now. 
That's a big country if, town. If Adelaide, if Adelaide was put in the place of England, it'd be the second largest city in, in uh, England. <laughs> Someone can prepare to not. I've heard this argument before from uh, our, our uh, Eastern friends. <laughs> <laughs> not from all of this, Paul. Just uh, Mark. Actually, uh, if just, you're going to rubbish yeah. anyone, rubbish Mark. Leave the rest of us out of it. We've got <laughs> nothing to do with it. You're on your own, Mark. That's all right. It's, the only reason is because Port, uh, Carl, Carlton can't beat Port Adelaide or, that's true. Um, or Adelaide. That's uh, no, that's true. Hey, guys, I'm, hey, guys, I'm, I'm in partial. Oh, right yeah. in the middle. I'm right on the board. I just want yeah. excuse me. Go, Joe. Joe. Go, Joe. Uh, I just uh, was wanting to point out that Kim was only probably, how many, Kim? Uh, four or five kilometres from the city centre? Pretty yeah, close. that's right, about, about four or five, and uh, yeah. 15 metres from an LED street light, mate. <laughs> that's a pretty yeah. impressive image, considering what you're dealing with there. Yeah. yeah. That's that's excellent. It is. So, and um, it's getting bright. You can see it's getting brighter. It is. Yeah. Each, each stack is getting better and better and better. Yeah. How, long are your, how long are your little exposures there? How long are you doing? Um, 30 seconds at the moment. 30 seconds, is, yeah, and it's just going to keep getting better each time. So the other thing that um, we should mention, and we mentioned it earlier, I'll mention it again now, is uh, the raffles, which will be drawn tomorrow evening. Um, we'll draw we'll draw those uh, during the Deep Sky section. Um, so if you haven't bought a raffle ticket yet, be sure to uh, jump on to either the ASSA or ASV Facebook. The posts are up there with the links through to the raffles. Uh, $5 a ticket, all the money raised goes to both of our non-profit societies. Uh, the ASV's fundraising portion will go to our Pathways to the Planets project. Um, but once again, thank you, everybody, for coming along. And, Kim, thank you for letting us finish with a live stack of um, Helix Nebula. Uh, if you're going to keep doing that one, can you show us the end result tomorrow night? Yeah, I might let it run for a while. Actually, I'll just uh, I'll just set it up properly. I'll I'll put the wrong darks and uh, biases on it. But anyhow, I'll I'll right. reset it. Fix it in post. Is that what they say? No, this is like EAA. I mean, I don't I don't want to process this afterwards. I just want to uh, do it live. Do it live. So yeah, it's looking good. To do post processing. Beautiful. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you everybody for jumping on and and. Lending your expertise tonight. It's been, uh, it's been great. So we'll say oh, goodbye for now. Everybody I must say, yep. just and before we do go, yep. this, this is really what actually happens at Vic South. It's like <laughs> being with old friends, seeing Joe and Kim and Paul and uh, Jen's been at Vic South. And, I'm not sure if I met Andy at Vic South, but um, no. it, it is just like being out on the field uh, at the Little Desert Nature Lodge or having dinner with everybody and shooting the breeze. So good to see you all, guys, and I look it forward is, yeah. to seeing you again tomorrow night. There's only one thing missing, Perry. Jen's um, 80s rock ballads blasting in the background. <laughs> 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 and, uh, we Prince will... in particular. <laughs> <laughs> and we and will... we've got um, uh, emu present left behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no dodging emu presence either, is there? No. That is the other one. So um, we'll so we'll see you guys tomorrow morning, bright and early, 11 a.m. Melbourne time, 10:30 a.m. Adelaide time for Paul's planetary processing and continue it on. Um, Thanks for joining us. We'll Good night, everyone. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye. Yeah.